church, I want to call your attention today to the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. I want to continue in our series, Seizing God's Size Opportunities. The first Sunday of the year, we talked about seizing God's favor. Last week, we endeavored to talk about seizing with divine imagination. So today, I want to call your attention to a familiar passage in the New Testament, Luke chapter 5. When Jesus calls his disciples, and let's take a fresh look at an old passage. Luke 5, verse 1, reads like this. On the occasion while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him, put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, for he... And all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. I want to talk about with the Lord's help in your prayers this morning, seizing while struggling. Seizing while struggling. Church Ralph Ransom Frederick said, without struggle, there is no progress. No greatness, no making of things happen. Church struggle is the book that we rather not read. Struggle is the day that we prefer not to come. Struggle is the email we prefer not to respond to. Church, the fact of the matter is none of us really like struggle. Struggle is inconvenient. Struggle is often intimidating and oftentimes it is downright exacerbating. It takes our energy level down and also has a tendency, if we're not careful, it can dash our hopes and our expectations. But many of us who have watched the lives of individuals know that even through struggle, Great things have been birthed. Oftentimes, some of the best songs have been composed from a heart that's in struggle. Oftentimes, great businesses have been launched after individuals have been laid off or fired from a job. Oftentimes, individuals have ascended and found themselves in the lofty heights of promotion because they have gone through the turmoil of struggle. But church, can we be honest? Many of us normalize and try to live life avoiding struggle. Talk talk to me. We try to insulate ourselves. We try to prepare ourselves in a way so we don't have to struggle because we're trying to avoid that at all costs. And when someone begins to struggle, we often put on our sanctified hats and start believing that there is something wrong with them or their situation. 
But may I park here parenthetically for a moment and suggest to you that oftentimes struggle is the first and final step to success. Sometimes God employs struggle in our lives to get us ready for our next assignment. That's the sovereignty of God that God can do whatever he wants to do when he gets ready to do it and God can take the very thing that frustrates you. God can take the very thing that seems to be crushing you. God can take the very thing that makes tears come out of your eyes and God can use that to catapult you to another level of success. Is there anyone here at this 8 o'clock service that can testify that it was through some struggles that God opened the door of success? And the word to us is we have to learn how to coexist with struggle. Who told you that you wouldn't struggle? Jesus said, in this life you will have trials and tribulations but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world he told Simon 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 Satan uh, desires to sift you uh, as we Job said it poetically that man that's born uh, of a woman and those few days uh, are filled uh, with trouble struggle is a part of the common core curriculum of life and God has a way of using that, using that for his glory and for us to be in his service. Listen, this text is a prime example of how struggle can open the door to success. Here we have Jesus who now stands on the banks of the lake of Gennesaret. The lake of Gennesaret is simultaneously tied to this term called the Sea of Galilee in the New Testament. It is an interesting piece of water because all of the cities that surrounded it, this was a fishing enterprise. This was a fishing area. Fishing was the driving force of the economy. So much so that the neighboring cities around this body of water, their names was associated with fishing. This, this lake is eight miles wide, 13 miles long. It is a small lake, if you will, but they called it the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus stands on the bank and he sees Simon and those struggling. And Jesus looks at them in the midst of their struggle and says, I'm going to recycle your struggle for my glory. That's what I want to tell somebody. Oftentimes when God comes to us, it's in a time when we don't have it all together. But listen, the word is as long as you're doing something, God can use you. God is in the business of using people who are doing something. Even if you're doing the wrong something, God says, I can still use you. And he comes to these fishermen, Simon and his crew, while they had been rejected. And Jesus says, now I want you to go out into deep water. This is the take home truth. I'm soon in my seat. God uses our personal struggles to catapult us to spiritual success. I said again, God uses our personal struggles to catapult us to spiritual purpose. Deed to do, avoid permitting times of strain to cause deafness to God's calling towards spiritual significance. Listen, church, all I want to tell you is you have to be careful because sometimes while we're struggling, we don't hear God as clearly as we should. But God, in the midst of our struggles, have a way of calling us to a level of deeper spiritual significance. So this is the first thing I see in the text is this. God sees us in the midst of our struggles. Notice the text. Jesus is now standing on the banks of the Lake Genesareth. He's standing. He's watching them. These boys had been 
fishing all night long. They've been fishing all night long, but when Jesus sees them, their boats are unoccupied and they're washing their nets on the side of the bank. L listen, this is a, a strange view. Listen, they've been fishing all night. Listen, if they didn't catch any fish, there's no stability. They can't pay any bills. They are going home rejected and dejected. But Jesus sees them and the text says that they are washing their nets. Can I push that for a minute? God sees them. God is looking at them. Jesus says it's something strange about this picture. But notice the text uh, they had fished all night they had done everything uh, they had known to do they are they are sincere in their pursuit who am i talking to all they have is the debris from the sea don't miss this they have the tools for success but no evidence of success they got nets and a boat but no fish who am i talking to you tried your best you've given it your all but all you have is the debris of frustration you gave it your best shot but all you have is rejection all you have is misunderstanding all you have is a broken heart but the good news is sometimes in life you are frustrated with the debris of failure who am i talking to today I don't know who I'm talking to, but this is for people who've been through something. This is for people who have tried their best and given it their all, but all they have is the debris of frustration, the debris of a broken heart, and you are managing the frustration of failure. But I got good news for you. Though they didn't see Jesus, Jesus saw them. And that's a good word for somebody. Even when you're not looking in God's direction, God is always looking in your direction. He says, I see you in what you're going through. May I suggest to you today, that's one of the hardest things. When you frustrated and you got the tools, you went to school and you still can't get a job. You living right. And things still don't seem like it's panning out. You know it's a God thing and people are trying to call it a satanic thing. Oftentimes we are left with the nets and the debris of the frustration of life. And sometimes we can become so preoccupied with the debris of frustration that we don't even see Jesus is looking at us. But can I tell you something? The good news is all the time when you're not looking in God's direction. The good news is God knows where you are and God knows what you're going through. Listen, I, I don't always know how God is going to get me out. But I know if his eyes is on me, some way, somehow, I get out of this thing. If his eye is on the sparrow, if he's looking over the birds, and if he's taking care of the grass, if he's taking care of other stuff across the world, if his eye is on the sparrow, I wake up in the morning and say, God, I'm frustrated, but I know your eyes is still on me. But there, there, there's... There's something else in this text I want to lift up. God challenges us in the midst of our struggle. Look, they, Jesus gets into the boat, which was Simon's. Jesus boards Simon's boat. And he transforms this boat into a mobile pulpit. If I was preaching another sermon, even what looks like failure, God has a way of transforming it. 
into his glory. He turns it into a mobile pulpit, and finally when he gets into the boat, and after he gets finished preaching, Jesus' audacity is literally off the scales. He says, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Listen, they, they ain't caught nothing all night long. I mean, I know we just read the Bible, but Jesus has a lot of nerves here. He, he says, I want you to put out into the deep Literally, he says, I want you to leave the place of rehearsed frustration. I wish y'all were hearing me. Sometimes you'll never secure success until you leave the place of rehearsed frustration. He says, put down your nets, let it down for a catch and Simon I like Simon because he's an honest person he says this he says but master we've toiled all night long wait 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 Jesus says I want you to go back to the place where you fail now this is the problem we always categorize faith as believing God for the new. But can I tell you something? You have to look at faith not flat on the surface. But you have to look at faith like a diamond. It has many components. But another side of faith is going back to a place that's old. That seems like ain't nothing happened. And maybe God is calling somebody not for something new. But maybe God is saying, I need you to go back to the place of failure and go back and revisit it because you thought it was rejection. But maybe I was just trying to get you ready to see another side of me. Maybe God's word for somebody is before you go forward, you got to go back. I know you don't believe that. Come here, man who lost his axe head trying to do the right thing and the prophet said go back to the place where you lost your axe head go back to the place where you lost your joy go back to the job that you've been frustrated with go back to the relationship and try to mend it again and go back to the ministry that broke your heart that's faith when you've been rejected and you didn't receive what you thought you deserved and you still pull yourself up and say I got faith to go back again can I tell you what real faith is faith ain't telling you nothing new faith is holding on to the old when you have new obstacles in your life Simon is so honest he says master We've toiled all night long. That word toil literally means to work to a point of fruitless toil. It means literally to work to the point of exhaustion. And I want us to be honest today. Some of us don't mind struggling. I don't mind struggling, but at least let me get some minimal results. I, I, I don't mind it being hard, but show me some good is coming out of this. But, but, but that ain't Simon's testimony. He said, Lord, we done worked all day and all night, and we don't have nothing to show for. He said, you want us to go back again? And can I tell you, this is faith. He says, but Lord, at thy word, 
I will let down the nets. He says, at that word, he says, Lord, I'm rejected. I'm frustrating. I'm frustrated, but I'm going to take you at your word. He says, at your word, we are let down the nets. But this is challenging. This is tension here. Because oftentimes when we're struggling, we endeavor to do the minimum. And oftentimes when we are upset, when we don't receive what we deserve or the type of work that we put in, we will respond to God with ceremonial or surface obedience. God, I'm just going to do enough. So me and you ain't on bad terms. God, I ain't doing nothing extra. I'm just going to do enough. I'm going to read my Bible enough where I'm not a heathen. I'm going to show up to church enough where if I die, I got a place where they'll have my funeral. I, I, I'm just going to do But notice, notice, I want you to look at the text. Peter does not respond with surface obedience. He says, Lord, at thy word, it's in the plural. Look at the text. He says, I will let down the nets. All I came to tell you is this. Don't expect great blessings with minimal obedience. And the word is God doesn't stop challenging you just because you're struggling. But maybe that's the time when God really wants to challenge you so he can strengthen and strengthen Stretch your faith. Listen, God says, I have the right and I have the audacity to call you to do more even when you're not getting what you want. Because what Peter does in verses 4 through 5 gets him ready to do what God wants him to do in verse 10. All I came to tell you is don't expect major success if you can't handle obedience in the midst of struggle. I let down the nets. But this is the word God can bless us in our struggle. Verse 6, he says, and when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to the other partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boat so that they began to sink. Listen, Simon and the crew responded, church, in the affirmative to God's word. I want to push this today, church. I want us to think through this passage. They did not wait until their circumstances improved to obey. I want to push somebody here that's frustrated. Oftentimes, your circumstances are not just going to improve instantaneously. But that does not give you an excuse not to obey that you just have to do it. God doesn't always wait for everything to get right for you to do right. You just have to learn how to do right where you are. The text says the crew that God blessed their efforts and God blessed their efforts in such a way that they had so much fish. They had enclosed so much that they never imagined. Doesn't that sound like God? That God has a way of when you obey, God has a way of giving you overflow. I know when nobody's shouting on that because we just won't overflow to bump into us. But it's when we obey, God gives us overflow. God bless their efforts and then God gave them overflow. But this is the tension. They got so much that they can't manage it on their own. So they have to call 
for the assistance of other people to help them. All I want to tell somebody is this. When God blesses you, don't run the risk of forfeiting the blessing because you don't want to ask somebody else for assistance. Some blessings require another set of hands. Listen, they got so much fish that their nets are about to break. And the word is just because you struggled alone doesn't mean that you have to enjoy the blessing alone. So it takes maturity to say I can't handle all of this by myself come on and help me handle this and God's word for somebody is you are running the risk of mishandling your blessing because you don't want to ask somebody else for assistance what I like about this God blessed their efforts God gave them overflow and God gave them assistance in the midst of their struggle. And I wonder, do I have 15 people here at the 8 o'clock service that can testify that God can give you what you need right where you are? It's tough, it's bad, but God can give you overflow. God can give you people to help you right where you are. You, you don't believe me, do you? Come here, Jacob. Jacob said, I wrestled with the Lord all night. And one thing we miss about that story, says, and God blessed him there. Can I tell you something? God can bless you there. In the midst of your frustration, there. In the midst of a broken heart, there. In the midst of a divorce, there. In the midst of your faith being fragile, I serve a God that doesn't wait till I get it together, but God can bless me even in a point of my deficiencies. You don't believe me? Come here, Paul. Paul said, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Look at somebody say, I'm weak, but God has blessed me in my weakness. So I can say his grace is sufficient for me. I got to quit. I got one more move and I'm done. God sees us in our struggles. God challenges us in the midst of our struggles. God can bless us in our struggle. But this is the good word today. God commissions us from our struggles. It's clear Simon and the boys are enjoying the undeniable blessings of God. It's right there in verses 8 through 11. But when Simon, Peter, they, they, they see this is nobody but God. That they are have been struggling and now they're shifting to success stories but when you see God is blessing you there's a couple of things you need to notice you need to recognize that God is at work look at the text it says and when Peter saw it he fell on his knees to Jesus uh, all this fish but it's something bigger than a miracle of fish here. This ain't the first time Peter done seen miracles. No, no, no. This ain't the first time. Because it was Peter's mother-in-law who became sick. And Jesus made a house call and healed his mother-in-law. But it's something different about this. It's something different about this miracle that Jesus came so close to his life, his profession, and his boat. God came so close to him that he saw something different. And the text says, and he fell to his feet. I want to push this today. Listen, life struggles have a way of giving you a flexibility of spirit and physicality. Listen, there was a time when you would not bow down, but struggles have a way of 
pushing you down at the feet of Jesus and recognizing who Jesus is. Listen, we want to shout on the miracle, but there's something much bigger than the miracle of the fish. This is just not a miracle, but this is also a theophany. It is when God has exposed himself. He said, Lord, I see fish, but I see something bigger. I see you for who you really are. And God has a way of showing us, taking us from self-confidence. This was the arrogant Peter fisherman. I'm an expert fisherman. We done fish in these waters all night long and can't nothing happen that ain't already happened. But when he obeyed God, he says, God, I see that there's something bigger than me here. And listen, God can take you to self-confidence to self-awareness. He says, I'm sinful. I'm unworthy. And can I tell you, when you've had a real encounter with God, you can't help but to be confronted with who you are. When you really had a miracle, you can't help but to say, God, I ain't all that I think that I am. All I can say is like Isaiah, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst an unclean people. Real miracles. Can I, I want to push this. Most of us, you want a miracle, but you really need a theophany. You want God to give you some stuff. You want God to give you another job. You want God to give you a bigger house. But God says you don't need more stuff. You need to have an encounter with me that exposes you to my person and my power. And can I tell you, a big miracle don't mean nothing if you don't change for the better. And God says, I want you to know me. And that's what we got here in Peter. Peter says, God, I know you better. But then finally, we, we recognize that God is at work. But then the other piece is we're recruited from our struggles. Uh, look at the text. When he bows down in front of Jesus, Jesus tells him, don't be afraid. Now you will be fishers of men. Church, they all shock. They're all beside themselves of what Jesus has done. But Jesus says, listen, I got more work for you to do from this miracle. He, he says, you will be fishers of men. Listen, uh, th this, the, the first time we see this phrase is in Jeremiah 16 and 16 says, and you will catch men for judgment. That's negative. But Peter had been catching fish to kill them. But Jesus says, now I have an alternative view. I don't want you catching to kill. Now I want you to catch to keep folk alive. It's a difference in the Greek. Listen, he says, since I've taken you from struggle to a success story, I want you to show other people of what I can do when I catch their lives. All I want to tell you is this, when God gives you success, the real measure of your success is if you help somebody else. That, that's all I came to tell you. That's when you know that you really season while you're struggling. Even while you're struggling, you can say, I'm going to help you while I'm helping me. Look at somebody and say, that's God's grace and mercy. And aren't you glad that God can take what was hard and what was harmful and God can use the very thing that almost shut you down. God can use that to give hope to somebody else. I ain't asked you to do it all day long, but just look at somebody and say, neighbor, I've been through some hard stuff, but maybe God took me through so I can help you get out. I'm out of here like this amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. I ain't trying to go that far, but it was grace that brought my liberty. I don't know why he came to love me so, but he loved beyond my faults and saw my needs. Have I got a witness here? Shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, 
I know you're struggling and I know you're straining, but tell a neighbor you can make it. Have I got a witness? I still got joy. I still had joy after everything I'd been through. I still got joy. I've been up. And I've been down, I've been talked about, I've been ridiculed, but God is using it for his glory. Have I got a witness? Shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, this is the last time I'm going to bother you. But tell them, neighbor, I know you're frustrated. I know you got an empty net, but tell them, neighbor. Drop your net again. Go back again. Try it again. Because God can turn your failures around. There is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. I'm out of here, y'all. But I've seen the lightning flash and I've heard the thunder roll. I've felt sin breakers dashing. I'm trying to conquer my soul. But I heard, I said, I heard, I heard. The voice of Jesus saying, Steal, fight on. Don't touch somebody, but just point at them. Fight on. Press on. Pray on. He promised never to leave us. Listen, sometimes God doesn't get you out of struggle. Sometimes God leaves you in. But somebody can testify God can give you success in the midst of struggle. Listen, I want to talk to somebody today. You've been mad with God with where you are in life. But God has given you a miraculous catch at a place where you didn't even think you could be blessed. And some of us can testify, God has blessed us in some strange places. Can I go all the way? And God has blessed some of us in the midst of our pseudo arrogance. Oh, Simon was talking big trash to Jesus. I know what can be done. And finally, there was some God. He says, Lord, just at your word. Can I tell you, learn how to live life at God's word. At God's word. At God's command. And then God will let you recognize who he is. And then God recruits you from your struggle. That's what I want to tell you. God can use the very thing that has been frustrating you for his glory. For his glory. Today, if you're here unsaved, unchurched, today is a good day. So I want to be used. I want to be used for God's glory. There's nothing better 